I've been talking about this time of testing that we're going through that's in season with God's appointed times. And I've shared with you a little bit about some of the struggles that people are having during this time, just, you know, being tested, holding on to faith, making that time that God has given them to do his work, whether it's in their family, whether it's in, um, you know, some sort of established ministry, whatever it is that he set us apart to do, the devil's trying to take us away from it. And he's trying to take us away from it in many different ways, rising some of our old fears, casting doubt on what God has brought us into, brought us out of and brought us into. And everything is at the sovereignty of God. There's nothing that the devil is bringing. You need to know that, that the devil cannot bring anything without permission by God. And remember that he had to go to God for permission to do what he did to Job. And not only that, it wasn't even the devil's idea. God said to the enemy, have you considered my servant Job? So God had a plan. He knew what he was doing. And he set up the parameters by which the devil could do certain things to Job. You cannot take his life. And at the very end, after Job had gone through everything that he went through, God said when he responded to Job, when Job was multiplying his words against God, God said, you brace yourself like a man and I will question you and you will answer me. Who is this who obscures my plans with words without knowledge? So basically I'm doing something here. What do you know about my plans? God's doing something here, guys. During this time of testing, he's doing something in season with trusts that are going to be given to those who prove worthy. And in order to prove worthy, you have to be tested. It's not skip to Malou, my darling. Oh my goodness, I haven't heard that song in so long. I don't know why that came to my mind. But you know what I mean? We're not just like skipping into it. We have to be built. We have to be crushed in order to do what he wants us to do. So during this time, I want you to know I'm being tested as well. And in the process of him testing me, he's bringing up those weaker parts of me that need to be strengthened. And it's the same with you. Pay attention to what he's bringing up. Don't just say, no, I'm going to resist. I'm going to resist. I'm going to resist and white knuckle it. That isn't what he's told you to do. He's told you resist the devil and he will flee. But he's also told you that you need to be built by him, that whatever he's raising in you, you need to address it. You need to be repentant, which means to turn from your wicked ways. And that includes doubting God. Do you remember that James says that those who doubt are unstable and swayed by the wind? Well, it's important that we are working our way into trusting 100% completely in God. That we are doing what needs to happen inside of ourselves, what he is raising, what he knows is we, that we're addressing where those fears are coming from, not that we're just making a decision to just obey because that's going to keep coming up. He is going to keep rising those weak parts of us. You have financial insecurity. Where's that coming from? He tells you not to get a job because you're doing his work. It's not enough for you to just say, okay, I'm going to obey. All right, fine. I'm going to obey. You need to work with your heart. You need to work inside of your heart in order to strengthen those parts of you that are not strong, that are weak. That's why I teach you the work that I do in Heart Known series. It is deeper work. It's not this superficial, okay, I'll obey. And eventually, if you're not working in your heart, you're going to break. You're not going to be able to, all of those areas that are weak are going to get you. You will not be able to stand if you choose to engage superficially. So I'm sitting here tonight and he's bringing up some of the weak parts of me. Um, I worked in my yard a little bit, you know, this evening once the sun went down. I know that's kind of weird, but I enjoy it later on in the day. So I went out into my yard and just, you know, harvested some stuff to take to my kids and just kind of tinkered around a bit and spent some time with him. And he started raising some of this stuff in me. And I was asking him to help me see and understand how the apostles went through these different things. Because when you're in ministry for him, there's a lot that comes up that you couldn't have anticipated. A lot of feelings that come up that you couldn't have known otherwise. And so my examples that I lean on are in scripture because I don't have any human 
live examples in real time. And he's known what he's doing. So for the last few weeks, he's brought up a lot of injustices that I've experienced in my life, and he's been showing them to me. And he hasn't brought it up in such a way that I necessarily, there's some things that I needed to work through, but the way that I've felt him bringing it up is showing me the things that I've gone through, showing me the ways that I've been hated, like hated for no good reason in the world, helping me to understand why, and also to understand the justice that's coming, the vindication that's coming, and giving me that sense of, uh, it's kind of weird because there's like a grief that comes up over it, but there's also this sense of hope and peace in knowing that he is going to vindicate. He has been preparing a table for his people before their enemies. And the thing that he's talking to me about tonight is that he set us apart to be a holy nation to him. And so he established nations in order to help us understand what a nation is. And not everyone in that nation that he called to himself made it. A lot of them didn't. And not all of them were supposed to. These things have been done as an example to us, even the establishing of nations, as an example to us of one nation that is called to him and many nations who are not. A little worm, right? He calls Jacob a little worm, a tiny little remnant that are chosen by him. Started out as a lot, many who are called, but a little remnant that are chosen. And he started to talk to me about how he talks about these nations in scripture, what he promises his nation regarding the nations, the many nations. Can you imagine one little, humble, lowly nation that's going to prevail over multiple nations, over the many who do not make it in him? And he's been talking with me about how precious we are to him, so precious that he will exchange nations for our lives. So I decided to do a study on the nations and what he's done for his people as an example of what's to come. Because we don't need to be afraid. We need to rest. We need to trust. In repentance and rest is our salvation. In quietness and trust is our strength. We need to just keep leaning into our trust of him, cleaning out those weak places, strengthening those weak places, and sealing up those chinks in our armor. And he will do it because he's able to make us stand. We aren't, but he is. Joshua 23, after a long time had passed and the Lord had given Israel rest from their, all their enemies around them, Joshua by then, a very old man, summoned all Israel, their elders, leaders, judges, and officials, and said to them, I'm very old. You yourselves have seen everything the Lord, your God, has done to all these nations for your sake. It was the Lord, your God, who fought for you. Remember how I have allotted as an inheritance for your tribes all the land of the nations that remain. The nations I conquered between the Jordan and the Mediterranean Sea in the West. The Lord, your God himself, will push them out for your sake. He will drive them out before you and you will take possession of their land as the Lord your God promised you. Be very strong. Be careful to obey all that is written in the book of the law of Moses without turning aside to the right or to the left. Do not associate with these nations that remain among you. Do not invoke the names of their gods or swear by them. You must not serve them or bow down to them, but you are to hold fast to the Lord your God as you have until now. The Lord has driven out before you a great and powerful, great and powerful nations. To this day, no one has been able to withstand you. One of you routs a thousand because the Lord your God fights for you just as he promised. So be very careful to love the Lord your God. But if you turn away and ally yourselves with the survivors of these nations that remain among you, and if you intermarry with them and associate with them, then you may be sure that the Lord your God will no longer drive out these nations before you. Instead, they will become snares and traps for you, whips on your backs and thorns in your eyes until you perish from this good land, which the Lord your God has given you. 
Now I am about to go the way of all the earth. You know with all your heart and soul that not one of all the good promises the Lord your God gave you has failed. Every promise has been fulfilled. Not one has failed. But just as all the good things the Lord your God has promised you have come to you, so he will bring on you all the evil things he has threatened until the Lord your God has destroyed you from this good land he has given you. If you violate the covenant of the Lord your God, which he commanded you, and go and serve other gods and bow down to them, the Lord's anger will burn against you, and you will quickly perish from the good land he has given you. Okay, what's the Lord's pattern? The Lord's pattern is, I proved myself to you, now you must obey and prove yourself to me. Then you will reap the promises. Then you will reap salvation, the fruit, the gifts, the purpose, the role being chosen in that role to serve in his church, his kingdom, his temple, his body. But you got to prove worthy and you can't return to the vomit. You can't even associate with these nations. Because if you do, what did Joshua say? If you associate with them, it will become a trap, a snare, a whip on your back, thorns in your eyes. You cannot intermarry because if you do that, and listen, we're not talking about race, guys. We're not talking about ethnicity. Intermarrying has to do with marrying foreigners who are not in his church. Those who do not believe because you will go off and serve their gods. Now, the caveat is if you're already married, you don't separate what God has brought together because you might be your spouse might be saved through you, through your example, through your sanctification. Your children are holy in that union, so don't separate. But I'm talking about the things that he has established. And you stay firm in not serving other gods. And your spouse will see that. And God will work through your example. Isaiah 43. But now this is what the Lord says. He who created you, Jacob, he who formed you, Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze, for I am the Lord your God. By the way, he has kept these promises, hasn't he? Leading the Israelites through the water that didn't sweep over them but snuffed out their enemies like a wick. Not one hair singed on the heads of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, but killed the guards standing outside of the furnace that they were thrown into. Does he keep his promises or not? Is he that God or not? For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt for your ransom, Cush and Seba in your stead, since you are precious and honored in my sight and because I love you. I will give people in exchange for you, nations in exchange for your life. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. I will bring your children from the east and gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give them up. And to the south, do not hold them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. Lead out those who have eyes but are blind, who have ears but are deaf. All the nations gather together and the peoples assemble. Which of their gods foretold this and proclaimed to us the former things? Let them bring in their witnesses to prove they were right, so that others may hear and say it is true. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, so that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me, no God was formed, nor will there be one after me. I, even I am the Lord, and apart from me, there is no Savior. I have revealed and saved and proclaimed. I and not some foreign God among you. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, that I am God. Yes, from ancient days, I am he. No one can deliver out of my hand. When I act, who can reverse it? This is what the Lord says your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. For your sake, I will send to Babylon and bring down as fugitives all the Babylonians in the ships in which they took pride. I am the Lord, your Holy One, 
Israel's creator, your king. This is what the Lord says. He who made a way through the sea, a path through the mighty waters, who drew out the chariots and horses, the army and reinforcements together, and they lay there never to rise again, extinguished, snuffed out like a wick. Did he make a name for himself? Is he referring to the name that he made for himself? Are we supposed to remember that name as we're observing these holy days? How important are these holy days, guys? How important? They remind us of the name that God made for himself. The name that he wants us to continue to memorialize. Every time we're observing those holy days, he wants us to remember who he is, that he is God, that he did these things and to believe. So here's what he says. Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I'm making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. The wild animals honor me, the jackals and the owls, because I provide water in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland to give drink to my people, my chosen, the people I formed for myself, that they may, may proclaim my praise. Why? That they may proclaim my praise. Yet you have not called on me, Jacob. You have not wearied yourselves for me, Israel. You have not brought me sheep for burnt offerings, nor honored me with your sacrifices. I have not burdened you with grain offerings, nor wearied you with demands for incense. You have not brought, bought any fragrant calamus for me or lavished on me the fat of your sacrifices, but you have burdened me with your sins and wearied me with your offenses. Do we deserve this? Do we deserve his sovereign choice to give us mercy, to make us objects of his mercy? No, we don't. But we will prove worthy in the covenant he has extended the covenant that says if you do these things you will be given the gift that you don't even deserve you get that if you do these things if you obey you will be given a gift that you could never deserve you still have to prove worthy of being extended the gift by fulfilling the covenant i even i am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake and remembers your sins no more. Review the past for me. Let us argue the matter together. State the case for your innocence. Your first father sinned. Those I sent to teach you rebelled against me. So I disgraced the dignitaries of your temple. I consigned Jacob to destruction and Israel to scorn. But now listen, Jacob, my servant, Israel, whom I have chosen. This is what the Lord says. He who made you, who formed you in the womb, and who will help you. Do not be afraid, Jacob, my servant, Jeshurun, whom I have chosen, for I will pour water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. They will spring up like grass in a meadow, like poplar trees by flowing streams. Some will say, I belong to the Lord. Others will call themselves by the name of Jacob. Still others will write on their hand, the Lord's and take the name Israel. This is what the Lord says, Israel's king and redeemer, the Lord Almighty. I am the first and I am the last. Apart from me, there is no God. Who then is like me? Let him proclaim it. Let him declare and lay out before me what has happened since I established my ancient people and what is yet to come. Yes, let them foretell what is, what will come. Do not tremble. Do not be afraid. Did I not proclaim this and foretell it long ago? You are my witnesses. Is there any God besides me? No, there is no other rock. I know not one. All who make idols are nothing, and the things they treasure are worthless. Those who would speak up for them are blind. They are ignorant to their own shame. Who shapes a God and casts an idol, which can profit nothing? People who do that will be put to shame. Such craftsmen are only human beings. Let them all come together and take their stand. They will be brought down to terror and shame. You know, I was talking with the sweetest old man down the street at a a little tiny church. I live in a little town. A tiny little church, you know, about, I don't know, 
a block down from my house. And I always see him out there kind of, you know, maintaining the grounds and stuff like that. And I, I stop and talk with him, but he never remembers that he met me. <laughs> but I was taking my walks, my walks, my dogs for a walk. And he wanted to say hi to my dogs. And we started talking and I kept trying to talk with him about, you know, I, I may have made the mistake of assuming that because he's working at a church that maybe he would hear something that I said. We started talking about the times. We started talking about what's going on here in California and the dingbat governor that we have here. And he was speaking on the authority of politics. And I kept trying to bring it back to the spiritual. I kept trying to bring it back to what is going on spiritually and the times. And he could not hear it. He could not hear it. That's an idol, you guys. That is an idol on which people are speaking, claiming that that idol of politics has authority. It doesn't have authority. God sets up kings and he deposes them. He hands his people over to the spirit they have chosen. He's doing all that and he's doing it at this time in history. And this man was going all the way back to Woodrow Wilson to tell me the history, you know, just like talking about the history of politics. I couldn't believe it. I was so stunned and so sad, so sad that this was the authority on which he was speaking. That even when someone standing in front of him was speaking on the authority of God and what God has said is going to happen and what the times are right now and what we're seeing, putting it into context, he could not hear it. It was so sad. All who make idols are nothing, you guys. God is it. And the world is going to tell you all kinds of things, all kinds of things about what you need to do in order to be secure. And they're going to talk on the authority of the world and they're going to do it for their own glory because that's what Jesus told us, that those who speak on the authority of the one who sent them have truth in them. But those who speak on their own authority do so for their own glory. There's no truth in them, whether it's making yourself an idol or making something else an idol in the world, all of those idols are nothing. Now listen to the way that he mocks those who set up idols, the work of your own hands. You don't even know what he's doing right now. We have no idea. And we're starting to get squirrely because we're like, I don't know what he's doing. I got to do something. I got a store. I got to get a job. I got to, you know, like all of these things. We're getting squirrely because... We don't know what's going to happen, but when was the last time we controlled what happens? <laughs> last I checked, I have never had control over what God was doing in this world, but he has known what he's doing and he brought us to a place. He pulled many of you out of careers and fields for his sake. He brought many of you back into your homes where you belong, feeding your family spiritually feeding your family. I know one such woman who's doing an incredible job at that. Of course, Satan would want to take that person back out of their home. They're feeding their family. They're raising their family to God. They're raising his army. Of course, he wants to tempt us away from the work God has us doing. What he's taken us away from in order to bring us into something new, in order to bring us into that purpose for which he set us apart. And I want to tell you from personal experience, you're going to need to be tested in order to stand in it because it's not easy. He's going to have to build your faith in order to stand in it because it's not easy. And you're going to need to draw on that faith that he's building right now. And he is going to bless you. He has made a place for his people in the wilderness where they will be taken care of. He will pour water on thirsty ground. He will make ways for us to travel. Now listen to what he says about those who set up idols, the nations that set up idols, the foreigners that you are not to mingle with. The blacksmith takes a tool and works with it in the coals. He shapes an idol with hammers. He forges it in the might of his arm, forges it with the might of his arm. He gets hungry and loses his strength. He drinks no water and grows faint. The carpenter measures with a line and makes an outline with a marker. He roughs it out with chisels and marks it with compasses. He shapes it 
in human form. Human form in all its glory that it may dwell in a shrine. Are you hearing this? So the blacksmith takes a tool, works it with the coals, shapes an idol with hammers, forges it in the might of his arm, and then he gets hungry and loses his strength and then drinks no water and grows faint as he's making his idol. The idol needs him in order to make it. We have a creator who made us. You hear the irony in that? The carpenter measures with a line and marks and makes an outline with a marker. He roughs it out with a chisel with chisels and marks it with compasses. He shapes it in human form, human form in all its glory that it may dwell in a shrine. <laughs> you hear the irony? He cut down cedars or perhaps took a cypress or oak. He let it grow among the trees of the forest or planted a pine and the rain made it grow. By the way, the rain God sent, right? It is used as fu- as fuel for burning. Some of it he takes and warms himself. He kindles a fire and bakes bread, but he also fashions a god and worships it. He makes an idol and bows down to it. Half of the wood he burns in the fire. Over it he prepares his meal. He roasts his meat and eats his fill. He also warms himself and says, Ah, I'm warm, I see the fire. From the rest, he makes a god. His idol, he bounds, bows down to it and worships. He prays to it and says, save me, you are my God. They know nothing, they understand nothing. Their eyes are plastered over so they cannot see and their minds closed so they cannot understand. No one stops to think. No one has the knowledge or understanding to say, half of it I used for fuel. I even baked bread over its coals. I roasted meat and I ate. Shall I make a detestable thing from what's left? Shall I bow down to a block of wood? Such a person feeds on ashes. A deluded heart misleads him. He cannot save himself or say, is not this thing in my right hand a lie? Remember these things, Jacob, for you, Israel, are my servant. I have made you, you are my servant. Israel, I will not forget you. I have swept away your offenses like a cloud Your sins like the morning mist return to me, for I have redeemed you. Sing for joy, you heavens, for the Lord has done this. Shout aloud, you earth beneath. Burst into song, you mountains, you forests and all your trees. For the Lord has redeemed Jacob. He displays his glory in Israel. We're not the first to be afraid, you know? We're not the first to be concerned about whether we're going to take, we're going to be taken care of. But God encourages us. He knows. He knows that we need him. He knows that. He set it up that way. And he has given us a word and his spirit to encourage us. This is what the Lord says, your redeemer who formed you in the womb. I am the Lord, the maker of all things, who stretches out the heavens, who spreads out the earth by myself, who foils the signs of the false prophets and makes fools of diviners, who overthrows the learning of the wise and turns it into nonsense, who carries out the words of his servants and fulfills the predictions of his messengers, who says of Jerusalem, it shall be inhabited, of the towns of Judah, they shall be rebuilt, and of their ruins, I will restore them, who says to the watery deep, be dry, and I will dry up your streams. Who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd and will accomplish all that I please. He will say of Jerusalem, let it be rebuilt. And of the temple, let its foundations be laid. God says, don't be afraid. So that means that we need to work our hearts into really resting in him and his spirit of peace will restore us. He has not abandoned us and he has promised that he will take care of us. This is what the Lord says to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I take hold of, to subdue nations before him and to strip kings of their armor, to open doors before him so that gates will not be shut. I will go before you and will level mountains. I will break to remember what a mountain is in scripture, a power, false Christianity. Zion is a mountain. There are many other mountains that think that they are powerful, but God is going to level them. I will break down gates of bronze and cut through bars of iron. I will give you hidden treasures, riches stored in secret places so that you may know that I am the Lord, the God of Israel who summons you 
by name. For the sake of Jacob, my servant, of Israel, my chosen, I summon you by name and bestow on you a title of honor, though you do not acknowledge me. I am the Lord and there is no other. Apart from me, there is no God. I will strengthen you, though you have not acknowledged me, so that from the rising of the sun to the place of its setting, people may know that there is none besides me. I am the Lord and there is no other. I form the light and create darkness. I bring prosperity and create disaster. I, the Lord, do all these things. You heavens above, rain down my righteousness. Let the clouds shower it down. Let the earth open wide. Let salvation spring up. Let righteousness flourish with it. I, the Lord, have created it. You realize the times we're living in right now. I mean, it's, these are hard times, but they are amazing times. What God is doing right now in his people, what he's building, we're blessed to be living during this time. Him bestowing on us a title of honor. And I know you're afraid. I hear, I hear in the workshop and in the Bible study, people trying to work their hearts into understanding, into taking up, being martyred. And I feel very emotional about that because I, I know what it is. I know what it is. And also I feel, I feel like some, this emotion is the emotion of the Holy Spirit, the love, the love that he feels for those who are working their hearts into that right now. God bless you guys for doing that. I have made a lot of peace with being martyred. I would, you know, he tested me at the very beginning of this thing, <laughs> but I'm watching you guys go through it right now. And I feel so much love for you that you're working your heart into that. I don't know yet if he's given you that window or that, you know, that window into his heart for those who are working their hearts into not shrinking from death and being martyred for the name. But oh my goodness. He is going to honor you. You are going to rise in the resurrection first. Those who are dead in Christ are rising first in the resurrection. That right there is honor. It's a huge honor to be living during this time. You are going to see things and feel things that people who lived before did not get to see or feel. And I, I'm reminded of what Jesus said to the apostles, blessed are your eyes because you see things that the apostles, excuse me, that the prophets before you longed to see and hear. And I'm saying the same to you because that is absolutely true. So of course, the enemy is trying, going to try to steal it away. Woe to those who quarrel with their maker, those who are nothing but potsherds, among the potsherds on the ground. Does the clay say to the potter, what are you making? Does your work say the potter has no hands? Woe to the one who says to a father, what have you begotten? Or to a mother, what have you brought to birth? What does it mean that the potter has no hands? Like, is he forming you without having the ability to form you? Without having the ability to be sovereign over what he has brought to being? As though he started this thing, but he can't fulfill it? Of course he can. This is what the Lord says, the Holy One of Israel and its maker, concerning things to come. Do you question me about my children or give me orders about the work of my hands? Is it, it is I who made the earth and created mankind on it. My own hands stretched out the heavens. I marshaled their starry hosts. I will raise up Cyrus in my righteousness. I will make all his ways straight. He will rebuild my city and set my exiles free, but not for a price or reward, says the Lord Almighty. This is what the Lord says. The products of Egypt and the merchandise of Cush, all those tall Sabians, they will come over to you and they will be yours. They will trudge behind you, coming over to you in chains. They will bow down before you and plead with you, saying, surely God is with you and there is no other. There is no other God. Truly, you are a God who has been hiding himself, the God and Savior of Israel. All the makers of idols will be put to shame and disgraced. They will go off into disgrace together, but Israel will be saved by the Lord with an everlasting salvation. You will never be put to shame or disgraced to ages everlasting. For this is what the Lord says. He who created the heavens, he is God. He who fashioned and made the earth, he founded it. He did not create it to be empty, but formed it to be inhabited. 
He says, I am the Lord and there is no other. I have not spoken in secret from somewhere in a land of darkness. I have not said to Jacob's descendants, seek me in vain. I, the Lord, speak the truth. I declare what is right. Gather together and come. Assemble, you fugitives from the nations. Ignorant are those who carry about idols of wood, who pray to gods that cannot save. Declare what is to be. Present it. Let them take counsel together. Who foretold this long ago? Who declared it from the distant past? Was it not I, the Lord? And there is no God apart from me, a righteous God and a savior. There is none but me. Turn to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. By myself I have sworn, my mouth has uttered in all integrity a word that cannot, will not be revoked. Before me, every knee will bow. By me, every tongue will swear. They will say of me, in the Lord alone are deliverance and strength. All who have raged against him will come to him and be put to shame. But all the descendants of Israel will find deliverance in the Lord and will make their boast in him. I hope this message encourages you. God wants you to be encouraged. And while you're going through this testing, I just want you to remember, he's not going to break you. He's not going to break you. You hear what he says. He's done all these things for a purpose, and he does keep his promises. Thank you for listening. God bless you.